Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. One of the great privileges, gifts, joys, treats of this podcast is the ability to break the rules. I make the rules, so I'm also able to break them. I can come to you off schedule, off script, off book, off topic, and bring you some little piece of history, some little piece of content that I think is interesting. And that's what I'm doing here today. I want to share this conversation that I had a few days ago with the great Peter Coyote. This was not intended as a podcast episode so much as it was a program that was organized and underwritten by Rabbi Severine. Uh, she's the rabbi at Temple Sinai in Newport News, Virginia. And she invited me to moderate a conversation with Peter Coyote, specifically about Buddhism and Judaism. Peter Coyote has lived... A lot of lives packed into one lifetime, and a big part of his journey has been his exploration of his relationship with Zen Buddhism, and speaks so comfortably about big and complicated ideas, makes them feel simple and accessible. So this was a no-brainer for me. I particularly wanted to talk about why Buddhism is so attractive to so many Jews, the whole idea of Jew booze. What's it about? Why Why does it happen? And we did talk about that, but we, we got into uh, a lot of uh, good stuff. This is a conversation that moves in multiple directions at once. I really wanted to be able to share it with more people. So I'm putting it in your feed here today. Peter Coyote was a previous guest on the podcast. Back in 2015, he was episode 31. Oh, my goodness. Feel free to hit the archive, third-story.com, to check out that previous conversation and many others, see how far we've all come since then. Then it's patreon.com slash third story podcast to make your own private offering to this ongoing project. Without further ado, I'm just going to let it roll. You'll hear Rabbi Severin. She's going to introduce Peter and then hand it over to me. And then it's about 55 minutes of freewheeling, good time, serious talk with the great Peter Coyote. So Peter Coyote's favorite biography is Peter Coyote came from nowhere and is working his way back. That's my favorite. And that's your favorite. <laughs> and, and he did send me a more elaborate bio, which I will uh, share with you now. Peter Coyote has performed as an actor in over 160 films for theaters and TV. His work includes some of the world's most distinguished filmmakers, including... Barry Levinson, Roman Polanski, Pedro Almodovar, Steven Spielberg, Martin Ritt, Steven Soderbergh, Sidney Pollack, and Jean-Paul Rapneau. He is a double Emmy Award winning narrator of over 150 documentary films, including Ken Burns, National Parks, The Dust Bowl, The Roosevelt's, for which he received his second Emmy in 2015, Vietnam, country music, and most recently, Ernest Hemingway and Ben Franklin. Mr. Coyote's memoir of the 1960s counterculture, Sleeping Where I Fall, which received universally excellent reviews and made three bestseller lists, has been in continuous print since 1999. His second book, The Rain Man's Third Cure, An Irregular Education, about mentors and the search for wisdom, was nominated as one of the top five nonfiction books published in California in 2015. His first book of poems covering 50 years of work is titled The Tongue of a Crow and went on sale in September. His fourth book, The Lone Ranger and Tonto Meet the Bud, conflates nearly 50 years of Buddhist practice, acting exercises, improvs and masks to foster liberation experiences cold sober, and teach people how to get out of their own way. It will be released by Inner Traditions Press on December 7th of this year. And so will his first book of poems, The Tongue of a Crow. An ordained Zen Buddhist priest and transmitted teacher, Mr. Coyote is currently giving live bi-weekly Dharma talks on Facebook and preparing a fourth book called Vernacular Buddhism. His Dharma talks can be found on his website. He lives on a small farm outside Sebastopol with his two dogs and a cat, 40 fruit trees, and a 1952 Dodge Power wagon. Turning 80 on October 10th, 
he has finally come to accept that he will never be the lead guitar player he could be proud of. So, Mr. Koyadi and Mr. Sidran, a hearty welcome to you. And Mr. Sidran, take it away. Thank you, Rabbi. One thing that was not made clear in your biography is your kind of early Jewish experience, considering the context here today. My early Jewish experience. Yeah, your, your early relationship with the Jewishness. Fetching. So my, my mother's people are Ashkenazi Jews, real shtetl people that came here at the turn of the 20th century, fleeing the pogroms and fleeing the czar's draft. Um, my grandfather sold, bought a watermelon and cut it up into pieces and pushed it around in a wagon and eventually owned a little three-seat soda fountain in the Bronx. Mm. Um, they were Orthodox people. They were kosher people. They were Yiddish speakers. And uh, the Yiddish that I have came from trying to decipher my parents' secret language, you know, when they didn't want their kids to know. Mm -hmm. um, so my father's people are Sephardic Jews, but my, my dad's dad was actually an Uzbek. And both my dad and my grandfather had epicanthal folds. They had black hair, high cheekbones. And last year I went to Mongolia to try to find out why my dad and grandfather were the meanest sons of bitches on earth. And I went to the eagle hunting festival and I found out why. <laughs> <laughs> These people are really tough and you're not going to get that out of your bones in a couple of years. And so for Jews to survive among those people, they had to be really tough. Mm. And my grandfather was a strong man in a carnival. He had a trick where he climbed two parallel ladders with a belt chained to a horse that he lifted off the ground by climbing these ladders. This was his trick. And when I was a little boy, he would fold a handkerchief in his hand and put a nail through it and drive it into a door and challenge me to pull it out. And I, I couldn't. So I had these both. I had, they were secular people. They were not religious at all. And the Sephardic Jews tend to be a little crazy because they're so uh, lineage oriented, like the Bostonians. They're such high status people that they tended to marry cousins because they, they knew they were good families. And so there's a lot of real craziness in my family, a lot of bipolar people. I have a cousin who's in jail for life. He's schizophrenic and he murdered his girlfriend when his when his medicine failed. And they haven't they haven't decided about me yet where, where on the spectrum I go. And another cousin's uh, inherited Einstein's chair for life at hmm. the uh, Princeton Advanced Institute. So it's a pretty eclectic and wacky, uh, wacky group. And my family was truly insane. They were pretty nuts. I can imagine based on that explanation that Jewishness was a little complicated for you did you i mean did you especially if that's what jews meant to you was the, the craziness and the and the aggression and all of that did you identify with being jewish did you identify with having a jewish identity when you were growing up not so much when i was young it came to me as i got older um so when i was young i grew up in the suburbs in the 40s i was born in 1941 mm. and you know, there was this idea that after the war, we were going to have this scientific, seamless, perfect future. And there were all these shows on television like Father Knows Best, and they were all Goyesha Cup. They were all white people and Christians. And at this time, Jews were not white people. I We couldn't join the country club a block from my house. There were schools we couldn't go to. There were laws that were passed that inhibited my dad and made him enraged. But he, he went to MIT at 15. He was smart enough to get around them. But it was very complicated. And when I went down to the Jewish Community Center to roller skate or something like that, um, the kids really creeped me out. They were always talking what their father owned or their mother owned or who had a big fur coat or who had a car. I didn't like them at all. And luckily, my dad's great passion was cattle ranching. And we had a ranch about an hour from our house. And there was a man there who was my hero, who was uh, 
an ex-game warden who had been in gunfights with the uh, egret hunters, the milliners from New York. And I came under his tutelage. So my goal was to be the first Jewish cowboy. And I learned to ride and rope. And we had another ranch in Texas. And, you know, my grandmother would say of my dad, Moish, she said, yeah, Moish has a ranch. He has a ranch in the West with kettle. And, you know, so that was one side of Jewishness. And then I, I wanted to be free of that. But as I got older, um, I began to be really proud of, uh, I thought of Judaism as three ships. One ship was a great spiritual tradition. One was a great cultural tradition. And one was a great intellectual tradition. And I started figuring out and learning that of all the immigrants that came to America in the turn of the century, the Jews were different than all of them. And they were different because they were all literate, 100% literate, because even the girls had to be able to read the Torah. And so because of that, with them, they brought all the sophisticated ideas of Europe. They brought Marx, they brought Engels, they brought Freud, they got brought the Bolshoi, they brought the Moscow Art Theater, which became the Jewish theater, which became the actor studio. Mm. And so I began to see Jewish culture as sort of pivotal to the most interesting parts of American culture. That's when I realized that I had been kind of branded. So, and I was proud of it, but I never practiced religious Judaism. I was bar mitzvahed for my grandfather. I was told when I turned 12 that I was going to be bar mitzvahed. And I spent the next year with a man called Mr. Feynman. And every time he opened his mouth, I was overcome with an overwhelming desire to sleep. And I would be studying and the kids would be outside playing and I would be like, I'd taken a morphine suppository, but I did it. I got bar mitzvahed. Then when I got to an age where I realized I needed some spiritual anchor, I discovered Zen Buddhism. I'd been reading about Zen for a long time, 14, reading about the beatniks and the beats, and they were all talking about it. So when I began to practice Zen, the first thing I noticed was 80% of the monastery were Jews. So they were all Jew boots. This is really, the, to me, the crux of the question is... What are the Jubus and wh why is it compatible and so attractive to Jews to discover Buddhism? I can only tell you what I think. I've never done serious research. So my feeling is that when two Jews argue, they're never arguing with each other. They're actually arguing about the truth which sits between them. And that's what's being handled and turned around and fressed over. And it's sort of not personal. And there's also a characteristic of Jewish culture to say, on the other hand, to always look, to be turning things over and over and over and over because they suffered under incredible restraints and restrictions. And of course, it forced them to become hyper observant, hyper vigilant, hyper thoughtful. One of the things that Hitler did, which was so pernicious, was that he hired fleets of psychologists. And they would pass out multicolored identity cards in, in the shtetls. Some would be red and some would be blue, and they meant nothing. But the Jews would be looking and Moish would say, wait a minute, he got a red one. His dad's a communist. Maybe this is better. And they would spend all their time disputing that until they were led away. Mm. Or they would be marched up a hill and at the top of the hill, there would be a guard pointing arbitrarily left and right. And all the people at the bottom of the line would be looking for clues. So in that way, their investigations and things were used against them. But I think it's a definite cultural characteristic. And it's a core practice of Buddhism. Because Buddhism doesn't even accept that the self is a fixed thing. It accepts, of course, we have self-awareness. But there's no organ within us that corresponds to a self. You don't know where your self is, what shape it has, what color it is, where it is in the body. But over a lifetime, by being told who you are and then implying who you are by the way other people respond to you and by your own thoughts and feelings, 
we kind of reify it into a self. And then we say, this is what I am. And then we're stuck. Then we've gone from being an awareness, which is fluid and can go in any direction to being a little nudnik, a little homunculus, which is stuck in there and has fixed characteristics. And so one of the practices of my life has been to get free of that, to get back to the original internal freedom, which is our birthright. One of the things when you talk about this that is confounding to me is, for example, I've heard you say before, there is no fixed self. There is nothing but your habits. Your habits are not the self. They're just a collection of your behaviors. But in order to get to this fluidity that you describe, if you really enter into the world of Buddhism, particularly Zen Buddhism, it's filled with rituals. Yes, it is. And when I think about the function of ritual, I mean, you know, the practice of Judaism is also filled with lots of rituals. And I wonder if you see those rituals as a tool, at least in Zen Buddhism, to get to the liberation that you seek to find? You put your finger on the right question. So one of the things that those rituals and things do is they force you into contact with the edges of yourself. You know, the self only has three options. You like something, you dislike it, or you're neutral. And so when you're suddenly put into a schedule that's quite fixed and quite rigid, at least in my case, after 10 years as a heroin addict and living absolute anarchic freedom, it was like crazy making. You know, why do we hold our hands like this? Why do we, why do I have to be here? Why do I have to do this? And all of that resistance is actually the the rigidities of yourself. So it took a while for me to understand that that actually served that coming to terms with those things and just doing it without, you know, fussing about it. It's just, we go from service to cleaning the Zendo to some office job to, we're just different um, incarnations moment after moment. So for a long time, it became a, a very useful practice. Then as I got older, like the, the book that, um, uh, uh, Severin uh, mentioned, is, is not called vernacular Buddhism, it's called vernacular Zen. I realized that in every country, country that Buddhism came to, it cloaked itself in gift wrapping that made it comprehensible to that culture. And so... Like when Chinese came, food. Yeah, exactly right. When it came from India to China, it mixed with Confucianism and Taoism and became Chan, which is what Zen became. When it came to Japan, it mixed with Shinto and Taoism and became Zen. Went to Tibet, it mixed with Bon Shamanism and became Wacky Do. So one of the things that I learned after about eight or 10 years in the monastery is that there were some downsides to what I call Japanismo which is the kind of slavish imitation of our idea of Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. Japanese are very physical people. They live quite differently than we do. They're quite more comfortable with hierarchy mm -hmm. and authoritarianism. And when Americans imbibe all these forms of Japanese Zen, they get a lot of authoritarianism and a lot of hierarchy, which are not part of the teaching. Part of Buddha's teaching was he included women, he included the untouchables, he included outcasts of every sect. It was wide open, it was boundaryless. I began wanting to loosen the Japanese gift wrapping to show people the real gift and explain it in vernacular American. I didn't want it to remain foreign. You don't have to shave your head, you don't have to wear robes, and we don't become Buddhists to make more Buddhists. We don't become Buddhists to make a lot of temples. We come, become Buddhists to free people from habitual enslavement to their own minds so they can be authentic. And so there was a long arc for me to see that. Now coming on the other side of it, what rituals or practices do you maintain? Do you keep in your practice as you've sort of processed all of that? It's a work in progress. You know, I was trained in this Japanese tradition, and I'm a priest. 
So I sit Zazen every day and I have a little room with tatami mats and little black cushions. It's very serene and very spare. And when I do memorials for the dead, I do them in these ancient languages, which predate, they're like Sanskrit that are, you know, translated into Japanese. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like reciting the Kaddish. I don't, I don't understand Hebrew, but I know what it means. I know what it's about. And I'm observing in the lineage of my forebears. And so I'm observing these memorial ceremonies. You make a card with a black border. It has the name of the person that goes on the altar. And there are various, um, various prayers and chants that I do on the anniversary of people's death, which I do for the living. So I reach out to them and I say, you know, I did your mother, I did my aunt today. And it's a way of touching base with a lot of people. I wear robes when I do weddings or when I do funerals, because as an officiant, you hold a certain space. I mean, the rabbi knows this. She's different when she's in officiating and when she's, you know, cooking. So I'm trying to find the, the right mix. I don't want to throw the baby out. I respect my tradition. I respect my teachers. But I'm trying to, you know, get a little more breathing room so that it doesn't feel foreign to the Mexicans that I work with or to the Americans that say, hey, will you tell me something about meditating? So I can't give you a fixed answer. Good. (laughs) I realized that I I cut you off as you were telling the story of when you first started meditating and going to the Zen Center and that you had, you know, you, you prefaced your journey your experience with Buddhism is saying you had read about it in Kerouac and the Beats, and finally when you walked in, you saw there were a lot of Jews there. For those who maybe have no understanding of Buddhism, I'm really interested in your personal experience, but I would love maybe if you could just give us a just a basic primer of who was Buddha, what is Buddhism? Okay, sure. I left that one little part of my hajira. After the reading, during the reading of Buddhism, I kept coming into contact with this name, Gary Snyder, who was a beat poet, sort of first among equals. And I later came to learn that he had gone to Japan, spent nine years in a Zen monastery, married a Japanese woman, and I was introduced to him by a friend and another beat poet named Lou Welch. And he was such an impressive person, and he lived a completely secular, completely un-Japanese life, I thought, oh, this is what a Buddhist life could look like. All right, so I'll tell you what happened to Buddha and what he taught. So Buddha was a prince in a royal family and a part of Nepal 3,000 years ago. His father was a king of the Sakya clan. He raised his son to be a warrior and a fighter and a killer. And he was in a huge, huge, huge estate And he organized things so that his son would never come in contact with sickness, old age, and death. So Buddha had a wife, he had children, he had courtesans, he had everything he needed. And then one day he told his driver to take him out in the world. This is the myth of Buddha's awakening. And he encountered an old woman. He saw bodies being burned in the street. He saw disease and he became obsessed by why? What is this? And he became so obsessed by it that he left home and he joined a band of mendicants living in the jungle and he practiced severe austerities. Um, They thought that there was a difference between matter and spirit as opposed to understanding that matter is the expression of spirit. Mm. And he brought himself to the verge of death. He passed out in in a gutter And a a young girl came by carrying a a big container of rice and milk as an offering for a temple. And she saw the Buddha unconscious and she spontaneously gave him the offering and fed him and brought him back to consciousness. And it's recorded that he was so moved by this act of spontaneous compassion. The girl would get in trouble for that, that he sat down in one place under this tree and vowed not to move until he was enlightened. And as he was sitting, he realized that he had been an extremist. He had had a life of indulgence, indulging every whim, absolute freedom for everything. That didn't bring him happiness. And he had this life of absolute denial, 
And so he made this decision that the middle path was what he should follow. And one morning he woke up and he saw the morning star and the bubble burst. The self disappeared temporarily, which it does sometimes. And he thought that what he perceived was going to be too subtle to teach people. He thought people were not educated enough or patient enough. And it took him 49 days pacing around. And finally, he decided he could help some people. And then the reason I know what he felt is because I had this experience. And I realized Buddha had this experience. And anyone can have this experience if you, if you work at it and get right. And so Buddha must have known that everything was empty from, of self, but he decided he could help some people. So when he walked back to his friends, they saw him and they were pissed. You know, they, he, he had eaten, he had gone away from them, and he had stopped the asceticism. But they also saw that the dude walking back was not the dude who left. And all of a sudden, they were making him a pillow, and they were setting things down. Hmm. And he gave his first lecture, which was the Four Noble Truths, which I'll tell you, which is really pretty quick. This has been kind of misapplied by Christian translators. But the first noble truth is the word dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A. It's a noble truth. These were Buddha's words. He knew what they meant. Truth means first and foremost real. And noble is dignified, worthy of respect, courageous. So dukkha has been translated as suffering. A better term for it is affliction, because the Buddha defined it as birth, as death, as illness, as sorrow, as grieving, as wanting to maintain pleasant circumstances, as wanting to push away unpleasant circumstances. It happens to you. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not an example of an inferior spiritual development. Hmm. It's the stiff wind blowing into the face of all living beings. That's dukkha. That's the first noble truth. The second noble truth is called samudaya, and it means arising. And when something afflicts you, something arises immediately. You can't help it. It's not your fault. You're too close to the fire, you get too hot, you move away. You're too cold, you move close. Somebody cuts you off in the car, you want to give them the finger. It's what comes up. Neither is that a source of shame. It is a noble truth. The third noble truth you can do something about, and it's called niroda. And niroda means abiding. It means uh, the image of it is a clay wall that's built around a fire pit. And any peasant could have understood what this meant, that fire is a useful thing, but if it gets out of bounds, if it breaks down boundaries, it can burn the entire village. So dukkha and samudaya, affliction and arising, are the fire. They're what move us. They're what change us from just sitting there looking at a butterfly all the time. Shit happens, shit arises. What you learn by meditating is that you can contain it all. And you can contain it with dignity. And most people who flee affliction and arising are not dignified at all. There's nothing dignified about being a drunk. There's nothing dignified about being an addict. There's nothing dignified about having illicit sexual affairs. There's nothing indignant about compulsive shopping. So Buddha said, we can model this. We can show people that they can face the stiff wind. They can hold it. They can not do harm. And when that's happening, meditating is allowing you to watch these things arise, realize that they're empty, that they're insubstantial, and they leave. And then the fourth noble truth is called marga, and it's the eightfold path. Of course, I'm embarrassed, embarrassed after 57 years, I can't remember all of them. They're basically directives of how you can model the life of a Buddha. Mm -hmm. It starts with right view. The right view is understanding emptiness. But it goes through things like right livelihood, right speech, right concentration, right deportment. And because Buddha was not a god, because he was just a human, you have an interior Buddha. 
Buddha represents wisdom and he represents your wisdom. And your wisdom represents the universe's wisdom. It's like the pregnant emptiness behind every form. If you imagine that there's an energy, maybe string theory, Mm -hmm. and it is just always becoming forms, dogs, whistles, dolphins, mountain ranges, civilizations, ants, bugs, leaves, just always becoming. That is the fundamental nature of the universe. And that emptiness is beyond contradiction. There's no good and bad in there. It contains everything. There's no nice guys and bad guys. That's what you consult when you're on the eighth pole path. I want to say something to you. Is this right speech? So you can catch it. And when you do it, this in itself is enlightenment. This is the product of of Buddha's enlightenment. And this is the product of living an enlightened life. So that's basically it in a nutshell. And all the other That's been mistranslated a lot because by by being translated as suffering, it tends to make people think it's a mental event. It's not just a mental event. Birth and death are not just mental events. Grieving is not just a mental event. So affliction is reminding you this is in the world. This is what the life of living beings is. And you can model the life of a Buddha, you yourself. And here's the eightfold path Mm -hmm. to model it. So that's the short form right there. The distinction of suffering and affliction speaks to a larger truth about translation in general as we inherit these traditions that are thousands of years old and have been passed through series of translations, how we're sitting here trying to decipher what did they mean? It's like a spiritual telephone, that game, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, There's a wonderful book which I, I, I turn everyone on to. It's called The Feeling Buddha. And it's by a really interesting British psychotherapist who's a monk in the Amida Buddha sect. And he's the one that began looking at this translation and going back into the Sanskrit. It had always bothered me because I had a wake-up experience. We call it Kensho. But that didn't solve all my problems. You know, it, you can't live there. You can't live in the formlessness while you have a body. You can stick your toes in the water. Uh, There's a wonderful image, which is if you imagine just an edge of the moon peeping out from behind a cloud mass, you can intuit the fullness of the moon behind the clouds. And that's what when you come back from Kensho, you can see, oh, yeah, a leaf is a letter from emptiness. (laughs) A bird is a letter from emptiness. My thoughts are letters from emptiness. But your problems don't stop and your karma doesn't stop. You become more skillful at dealing with them and you don't translate them into further difficulties and further problems. Right. So many many Zen people, for instance, one of the big problems I have is they never talk about their problems or their difficulties Mm. because they're afraid, oh, well, if I've got this problem, no one's going to believe I'm enlightened. You know, well, who cares if you're enlightened or not? If you can't be kind and helpful to people, Who cares what your spiritual experience was, you know? So get the blocks out of the way. Talk to your friends and fellow practitioners about what your human experience is about. When you were describing your relationship with Judaism, you said, I never practiced religious Judaism. Essentially, you were a secular Jew. Yeah. Is it possible to be a secular Buddhist? Yes, I think so. I think so. One of the models of Buddhism, my teacher ran a a sangha, a sangha is like a group of people studying, called Vimala, Vimala Sangha, and was named after Vimala Kirti, who was a layman considered second only to the Buddha in wisdom. And uh, he was known to go to the racetracks, the gambling halls, the bars, the brothels, everywhere, just preaching the Dharma. And we don't know, maybe there was a big shift in Buddhism for about The first 500 years after Buddha, people thought the emphasis should be on just enlightening yourself. Mm -hmm. And that became sort of a closed world. And about 500 years in, Mahayana Buddhism developed, which was, no, you have to bring the entire world with you. You're not a separate integer. There is no solely your enlightenment. And so we don't know if Vimalakirti actually existed or if he was a myth that was made up. But he's very, very high in the Buddhist pantheon 
as an example of a secular Buddhist. Hmm. This idea also of doing it with the intention of helping others, of, of healing the world, is very Jewish also. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's compatible with the idea of tikkun olam, of healing the world. Yeah, exactly. Or the Lama Dvav. When you talk about this moon peeking out from behind the cloud, I'm reminded of experiences that I've had playing music, where you ultimately are kind of chasing these rare glimpses at a kind of passivity where you experience something like this universal music that passes through you, you know? Maybe not only in music, but in acting and improvising in, in your... In everything. You've had this experience. Yeah. I, it's, I call it the spinal telephone. You know, the spinal telephone is plugged into the universal trunk. So, for instance, Buddha's assertion is that we're all enlightened. And the only thing that stands between you and recognizing your enlightenment are sort of unresolved dark impulses, greed, hatred, and delusion, which are the big three package that all children are born with. It's the human package. Hmm. You know, there's nothing needier or more demanding than an infant. But that same infant can grow up to be a rabbi or the Dalai Lama or Bishop Tutu or Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X through practice, through work, through deep thought. So I like to tell people the back of your head is open onto the universe. And when we're at our most sublime as artists, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we just don't know. So, in fact, that, that, that is the same thing. I mean, I, I was half expecting you to say to me, but it's not the same. You're talking about playing music. I'm talking about meditating to reach enlightenment. And if I'm hearing you right, you're saying, no, it's actually all kind of the same telephone receiver. I think it is the same spinal telephone. I think that what happens is that one of the things about meditating is your body is completely still. So you're not feeding the mind any impulses. And there's something about being still and focusing your attention on just your exhales that allows the mind to really slow down. You can't slow it down, but it'll slow down on its own if you just get still and single pointed with your attention. In that state, it gets a little easier to step outside your personality or drop below it, whatever the image is, because your true self is not your personality. It's not your ego. Your ego floats in the vast emptiness of big mind, Buddha's big mind. And I think you touch big mind in music. I think you touch big mind in any act of selflessness. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to write about vernacular Zen. These are not foreign experiences. A carpenter can fall into that at a certain moment. And to recognize what it is and its utility to me, connects a whole new population of people to the lineage of Buddhist practice as not foreign, as experienced. So it's kind of possible to sneak it in. It's like sneaking in the vegetables into your child's macaroni and cheese. Yeah, or sneaking the tongue to my dog under the table. <laughs> <laughs> I want to encourage people to, to write in questions. And while we're waiting for that, maybe we should talk about your book of poetry. So... I came out to California to study with a poet named Robert Duncan, a man I really admired. And Robert Duncan was a strange genius. His IQ had never been captured. It was just off the charts. And he was a curious man. He was wall-eyed. You could never tell where he was looking in the class. And his, uh, his lectures were like impossible. They would run from Etruscan poems to quotes from the from the Greek oracles to Ezra Pound to this one to that one. I, I didn't have an idea of what he was talking about. And I looked at the kids on either side of me and they're going, mm -hmm. and I just thought I was too stupid for poetry and I left graduate school, but I kept writing. And uh, many years later, one of my friends was another of Gary Snyder's friends, a poet named Michael McClure. And he was a great friend of Robert Duncan's. And I was telling him that story. And when I got to the part about the kids nodding and going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Michael said, they lied. <laughs> anyway, about five years ago, I was 75, I, I realized I had this drawer with two or 300 poems in it. 
and my kids were going to find it and it was going to be a problem. They were not going to know what to do. This was their dad's stuff and they were not to know what was good, what was bad. So through chain of events, I found a wonderful poet in Massachusetts named uh, Patrick Donnelly. And we started going through about five poems every two weeks. He really taught me how to interrogate them and take them apart. <laughs> Sometimes he would take a two-page poem and pull one paragraph out of it and say, that's the poem. And I'd be going, no, 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 my precious babies, my words. Over the time, we pushed, you know, all those poems into this tiny little book. And uh, so he sent it to the best poetry house in New York. It's called Four Way Press run by a woman named Martha Rhodes. And he said, um, well, don't get your hopes up. I sent mine in and uh, it took me a year to get my first response. And <laughs> three days later, he called me a little pissy because they'd accepted my book. So it's been kind of a thrill and kind of like the other shoe dropping to have this book. I'm working now as I've gotten so inspired. I've, I've been writing a lot the last couple of weeks since this came out. Hmm. What did you learn about poetry? What is a poem? What does a poem essentially want to be? What did you learn about that by revisiting this work? Well, I learned that it's a very concise and concentrated expression of thought or a moment or a relationship dynamic where each and every word carries the maximum freight that it can carry. Convicts love poems because you can spend so much time on them. They can move so multi-dimensionally, and um, that's what I learned to do. I would write, think I was writing a poem about one thing, and he would show me two or three other themes that I had un unintentionally triggered hmm. by the choice of words that I had missed. So um, that's what I've been learning to do. And and now five years later, um, I'm not just stupidly going, "Oh yeah, right." But we're interrogating the poems together, and I'll say, oh, yeah, I really mean this. But he's the guy that really got me on this path and really helped me. But it's, it sort of sounds like you're trying to figure out what you mean. You know to write it. Your pen touches the paper and writes these images, but then you have to sort of figure out, well, what am I saying? What do I mean when I say this? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I used to work for the governor of California, Jerry Brown, and I ran the State Arts Council, which set art and cultural policy. And we decided all the board was working artists. Gary Snyder was one, Ruth Asawa, there was eight of us. And we decided we didn't want to just create artifacts and sell art, that artists do something that's much more significant than that. And so we called it the creative process. And we described it as all art begins in the same way. It comes from an impulse. That impulse may be expressed as a couple bars. It may be a line. It may be a color. It may be a movement. It may be a sentence. And it comes out of mystery. And then you back up and you appraise it logically. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What are, the, what are the implications of this? Where does this want to go? What's this trying to do? And you do another couple bars or another mm -hmm. phrase or another line. And little by little, interrogating back and forth between the intuitive and the logical faculties, this art manifests itself. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a kind of abiding principle of mine uh, ever since, ever since understanding that. And so that's the way poems assemble themselves. It may be just a phrase. It may be just a feeling. I'm not walking my dog and something stirs me. And you put a few words down. Then you have to, well, what am I going to do with this? You know, I'll read you something. Please. Because this is unlike, this is something that I had no intention of writing. This is called The Burned Oak. And I realized I was actually writing about the Trump years. But I, I had no idea, and you might not know if I hadn't told you. They rooted too long during the war, ate the tender shoots after the forests burned, the water fouled. Mount a watch, heard what swine are left into the rusty pen, make a gate from the old barn boards. Women wet the knives. The oldest boy chooses shoots it in the head, 
A 22 will do the job, but it may scream. Mm. Force a sharpened rod between back leg, tendon, and bone. Hoist it into the burned oak. Cut the throat, drain the blood into a bucket, if you can find one. Pour scalding water down the body. Scrape the hair off the skin. Take a sharp blade, slice the belly open, move the organ meat to the kid's wagon. Squeeze the guts clean, wash for winter sausage. We need something like a barrel to pack what we don't eat with salt in case the generator goes, in case we have to fight again. Mm. So, I mean, that's where I saw red and blue state warfare leading to some kind of total desolation. I'll read you just one more that's a little more, more Buddhist. It's called Two Conversations in Chicago. If these walls could talk, huh? She gurgles conspiratorially, maneuvering a pink suitcase between the stainless steel jaws of the elevator as they hiss closed. I'm trapped in the bad air of her soiled hair, sullen face, cheesy white plastic belt and cheap shoes. I disguise a gasp as preparation to speak. These walls, you mean the Capone thing, Chicago? She cocks her head as if inquiring if I'm alive. What did you think I meant? And the rumble of our descent appears to emanate from her mouth as a growl. I couldn't say I wasn't thinking anything. I didn't say, why don't you get your teeth fixed or brush them? I nearly said, hey, I've been demoted by divorce of a wife I never cheated on to this shabby shithole hotel and the forced confinement of an eight floor drop while my silence is being violated by a woman resembling a pork chop. I wanted to say, couldn't we just stand here quietly while I stare into the perfect, undistorted mirror of myself that is you? So I was going to ask you the whole time you were reading it, so tell me why you think this is a more Buddhist poem, although I think you sort of walk us up to it at the very end. Yeah, that's why. Because the Buddhist doesn't deny what you're actually feeling. You don't denigrate your own feelings. I didn't say any of those things. And reviewing them finally led me to the understanding that I'm the beast here. I'm what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm my own judgments and stuff. So, you know, you don't know when when you start writing. There's some questions here that I want to make sure that we get to, and they're not uh, trivial. The first one is, can you talk more about what the true self is if it's not your personality? Should this be more of what we expose in everyday living to everyone, or is the true self meant to be shielded? The true self is beyond your manipulation. It's beyond expression. An ancient Zen student was challenged by his teacher to reveal his understanding. And he said, uh, if I don't speak, I'm a coward. If I open my mouth, I lie. So our personality is what we have. The challenge is to be authentic, to own really who you are in the moment. And the fact that you live in that or you ripen that with trips into the transcendental is what gradually allows your narratives and your judgments and your stuff to soften. Because the implication of emptiness is that we're all made of the same thing. I may not like that I'm made out of the same stuff as Donald Trump, but it's a fact. That fact means that the salient questions are, what are your experiences that led you to different conclusions than mine? Not that I'm a good guy and you're a bad guy. It was the good guys that dropped bombs on hotels in Baghdad and killed men, women, and children in their beds. If you ask those people who the terrorists were, mm. they would say the people dropping the bombs. But we could do that without thinking because we defined ourselves as the good guys, which meant we pushed our shadows onto other people. Buddhists have to own it all. So the reason we monitor our behavior and decide what thoughts and what impulses 
we allow past our teeth or to energize our muscles is because we know that the entire human spectrum runs through us from Mother Teresa to Pol Pot. And not knowing that makes you a dangerous animal. Actually, I think that dovetails very nicely with the poem that you had just read about watching your thoughts, evaluating it, and then reaching the conclusion. Yes, right. One hopes. Thanks. (laughs) Okay, here's another one. Could you address the limitations of words? Roland Barthes uh, spoke of the dictatorship or tyranny of words. We are completely mediated slash medicated. (laughs) It is about a nothing. Well, I, I completely understand. Remember, before we have language, we have an undivided consciousness. And little by little, everyone who comes up and speaks to us is selling us a description of the world. Oh, look the little cheek. Look, say hi to mommy. Wave, look at the birdie. Look at the kitty. And somewhere around six or seven, we can run the movie, all the things we've been taught as an unbroken chain, and then we are acculturated in the culture, then we're members of the culture. Mm. So the problem with with naming things is that names give the illusion that things are separate, discrete, and graspable. And it's not that they're not, but that's only half the truth. The other half of the truth is that they're all part of one big thing. There's no Leo without oxygen, without water, without microbes in the soil growing your food, without pollinating insects, without, you know, without birds controlling the pests, take it all the way out, people plowing, planting, growing the cotton, weaving to the earth's place in the universe. If we were closer to the sun, water would burn off, we wouldn't be here. Mm. If we were farther away, it would freeze, we wouldn't be here. And the earth is held in place by all the gravitational forces of the universe. So wisdom might be, a shorthand way to express wisdom might be oscillating back and forth between that singular and that holistic view, because each side has a shadow. The singular side doesn't see the whole picture doesn't see that we're all ticks on the body of a dog. The holistic view uh, doesn't give full credence to the miracle of the individual thing. What's a butterfly to a shopping center? (laughs) What's a salamander to a hospital? Maybe the hospital should go here. Maybe it shouldn't. But we should be negotiating that because the salamander is a unique, unrepeatable experience, just like we are. No one has any deep feelings about artificial flowers because they're not dying. But everything you see is passing and transient. It's what makes it precious. And words tend to fix it. And so one of the things that meditation does is it shows you the kind of transience of words and the, the emptiness of words. We confuse the word with the thing it's designating. And we consequently think that when we're talking liberal and conservative, we're actually saying something. And both opponents are using the same words with totally different meanings. So I'm, I'm with that questioner completely. I'm with Barth completely. The, the real truth is way below language. This is, you know, this is this typical kind of thing that happens in these chat boxes where people, they want to just... They want to say something. It's like they want to be heard rather than asking a question. I'm just going to read this as I see it here because it's, you know, people like to just talk sometimes. Just a comment, not a question. You see where this is going already. Your ability to navigate the pregnant emptiness is in fact the jazz way of travel, so perhaps you simply haven't mastered an external voice with which to express what your inner voice knows. Great Midrash, Ben Sidron. (laughs) <laughs> I, th- I think he's being really kind. That's exactly, that's exactly right. I'm so pleased to hear that. It's just, I have difficult with, difficulty with patterns, pattern recognition. And as a guitar player, I'm always swimming. You know, on the, on the piano, there's one middle C. On the guitar, there's 108. I don't know. So it's like, yeah. And of course, that's the awareness that I bring to wanting to be able to do on the guitar but that's not what I dedicated the thousands and thousands of hours of my life to. But I can still kvetz about it. Mm-hmm. Well, is non-attachment, is, is that related to Zen Buddhism, the idea of non-attachment? 
it's a really tricky thing to talk about. If your mother died, are you not supposed to grieve? Attachment bears a price. Grieving is the price of loving. It's the cost of a ticket into the love house. So I don't know how you live a life without attachment. But you can come to understand that the attachments are fleeting, that everything's moving and changing. And you have to, you have to acknowledge the grief as honorably as you honor the living person. And when you do that, you can burn it to ash and it will pass too. I'm always cautious because there's a psychopathic mm. potential, right? If everything's just a soap bubble, why not kill? So that person is not understanding the miraculousness of the housefly that lands on your thumb. We have no idea how it was created, how it came to be, what its reality is. I flew on a plane once with a Polish man who was Einstein's secretary. And he told me a story that when, when Einstein was editing his unified field theory, a beetle flew in and landed on the paper. He was on the outside reading, and he was transfixed watching it. And he withheld the publication of the unified field theory for a year because he told his secretary, I have no idea about this beetle and how um, what hubris to reduce the universe mm. to a single formula. <laughs> so, you know, I'm always careful about non-attachment. I think if you understand that what you're attached to is going to be ripped away from you, including your own body, um, you can do your best to remember that. One day you're going to exhale and your body's not going to inhale. And in some way, meditation is a practice for that. Mm. We follow each exhale. We give ourselves away. It's like a practice for dying. And if you inhale, you go, oh, whoopee, I'm alive. Okay, let's have a cookie. I never heard that wonderful explanation for why the exhale is the focus, why you look at the exhale rather than the inhale. And I've often wondered, why are we so focused on the exhale? Because the inhale is greedy. <laughs> the inhale is wanting to live. I know a very cute, very short joke. Moish was in bed and he was dying. And Rachel was downstairs. She was cooking arugula. And, you know, the son was there by the bed. And Moish said, oh, man, there's one thing I would like before I die. Please, just one thing. I would like the taste of one of your mother's rugula. Would you go to the kitchen, please, boy? Get me, come, boy, chick. Get me a rugula. He goes, sure, Dad, sure. He goes running down. Rachel's got all the rugula goes. He reaches to take one. She goes, ah, it's for after. <laughs> That's my sense of humor. You know, you should always close with a joke. So I think maybe we have reached our own private enlightenment today. I have hundreds of Jewish jokes. They're all named after my parents, Moish and Ruti. But I'll tell you something that's almost a Jewish joke. Every weekend, my dad would go to the deli and he would bring back chopped liver and white fish and potato salad and kosher special franks and everything, chopped liver, everything you could imagine. The table would be groaning. And he would sit there for a minute and he'd say, Ruti, this food has killed more Jews than Hitler. Let's eat. <laughs> That's my family. There he was, my friends, the incredibly enlightening Peter Coyote. Thanks again to Rabbi Severine and Neil Sokol for inviting me to be a part of this beautiful conversation and uh, for opening up a conversation like this to their own congregation. I'll be back again in your headspace before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. 